Well, hello there and welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at Charles Hodge. Hodge was an American theologian who did his work at Princeton University in New Jersey. And Hodge is almost a mirror opposite to Schleiermacher. Hodge is said by some to be the forerunner to fundamentalism. And we're going to look at how that works today. Hodge was one of the more influential American theologians, perhaps the second most influential behind Jonathan Edwards. And in many ways, evangelicals find Hodge to be uh, more of an influence on their own theology and their own lives. So we'll look at his life and work today. Now, Hodge began as a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary in 1822. Hodge would have been 25 years old at that time, a very young man to start as professor of seminary, and Hodge stayed there for another 50 years. Several years after taking this position, Hodge went to Germany. And when he was in Germany, he studied under Frederick Schleiermacher and several other well-known theologians. Hodge then became one of the unique Americans who really knew German theology well. He was quite up to date with trends in higher critical method in the study of the Bible. He was quite aware of modern theological trends. And so when he comes back to the United States, he's equipped as one of the few Americans who is very well versed in what's going on in Europe. He then is going to lead the charge to oppose what he sees as problems going on in Europe. If we're going to understand Charles Hodge, we have to understand him in light of his opponents. Now, Hodge had a lot of the opponents, but really they come down to two. Revivalism and trends going on in Europe that we call modern theology. Those were the two things that Hodge was against. Now, one result of the Enlightenment was the limitation of knowledge to what can be proven logically or scientifically. That is, knowledge came to be what can be empirically verified through certain tests. And if it couldn't pass those tests, those scientific tests, then it was categorized in the realm of opinion. That puts religion in the realm of opinion because it doesn't seem to be able to be verified in quite the same way that scientific data, which we can get at with our senses, can be verified. Hodge thought the solution here was to show that, in fact, Christianity could be verified in the same kind of way, that science and religion both operate with the same criteria of truth, that truth is a unity, and that the way to go about theological truth is the same way that scientists go about scient finding scientific truth. And so we'll see that played out in Hodge's method. Now Hodge is a Calvinist, and what Hodge wants to do is to go back and retrieve Calvin and Calvin's ideas, particularly the scholastic reformed thought that developed after the life of Calvin, and he wants to bring that into the American setting as the means by which we can combat modern theology, he thinks. We need to go back to Calvin, back to Protestant orthodoxy, specifically Reformed orthodoxy, away from Arminianism and free will, which has led, he thinks, to expressivism and to revivalism and to emotionalism. We need to go back and we need to find that logical framework of thought developed by later Calvinists, and we need to bring that into the discussion as a reaction against modern theology, and Hodge thinks that is the way forward. So let's begin by looking at Hodge's reaction against revivalism and expressivism, basically a reaction against subjectivism. Hodge believes there is objective truth. He believes it's been revealed by God, and he believes it can be known in Christianity through the Bible and systematized as a set of doctrines. And so Hodge is going to be very resistant against these movements. Now, the first one is a uniquely American phenomenon, the idea of revivalism. You see the tent camp meeting up above. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of the 
uh, prototypical understanding of how revivalism worked. Get a, a very eloquent preacher who would come in and give a very powerful and emotional message. Now this began with the Great Awakening and the first revival um, in, around the time of Jonathan Edwards. George Whitfield was the great preacher. And that first Great Awakening was quite more grounded in rational thought and Calvinistic principles and logical doctrine than would be the second one. The second one is contemporary to Charles Hodge, led by Finney. Charles Finney was not a great theologian by I think anyone's standards, and Finney was em wanted to emphasize the need for emotion in becoming a Christian. And so that's the phenomenon of American revivalism. Now, Hodge wants nothing to do with revivalism. Um, he's, it's spoiled by the Second Great Awakening, as far as he understands. And what he wants to do is to show that becoming and being a Christian is not primarily an emotional event. It's an event of the mind. It's an event in which we're transformed by the renewing of our mind as we accept and seek to understand God's revelation to us. Now let's look at the more important one here, which is expressivism. One of the marks of modernity is precisely a shift from meaning as a seeming in light alignment with the cosmos to meaning being a task left up to human beings to create. Through the Middle Ages, through the Reformation, and definitely through Reformed scholastic theology, meaning was alignment with reality. So if God is a righteous judge, then one wants to align themselves with God's way of doing things. If God foreordains everything to come to pass, then the job of life is to align oneself with God's plan for the world. There's a shift in modern theology and it comes through Kant. Kant says we really can't know very much about God at all. He's a necessary presupposition, but we can't really know much. The reality of human beings is to be rational. When we're free, we're rational beings, but that seemed to take away from human authenticity. Really, are we just rational beings? Do we not construct and build and create systems of meaning? Are we not individuals precisely as we bring newness into the world? as I create something, as I build something, as I share something. I'm bringing newness into the world. And so expressivism is the attempt to show how human beings bring newness into the world and how they create, in a sense, meaning for themselves. So it's seeking to recover meaning to life that has been eliminated by rationalists and especially Kant. So, like the ancients, they argue that life is the realization of purpose. But now, meaning is not located in the cosmos, that is, I don't align myself to reality, but I create reality. Meaning is in me. And so I construct it and develop it, and I align myself with what I've created rather than trying to align myself with some grand purpose out there, some cosmic purpose that I may not fully understand. So our freedom then for Kant was the freedom to be rational, to go along with reason and to go along with rational thought. For the expressivists, our freedom is the freedom to express and develop our natural ability. And so they want to go back and reconstruct the importance of uh, individuality and individual expression. You can see this in Schleiermacher's hermeneutics because he's trying to show that language is an art and each individual uses language differently and that's their creative expression that's how they're able to bring newness into the world hodge wants nothing to do with that he sees that as relativism he sees that as subjectivism he says why don't we want to align ourselves with reality as it is that's the old Calvinist way of doing things. God has foreordained everything that will come to pass. God elects 
God guides, God's providential action is sovereign, and I want to align myself with that. Any kind of creation of meaning for myself is simply a, a, an attempt to react against or to even rebel against God's sovereign plan for my life. Now, Hodge is also going to react against rationalism. What's really interesting here is that he constructs a rationalist system of theology to combat the problem of rationalism. It's an interesting trait of modernity. Those who react against modernity usually do so on the terms of modernity. We'll see that with all groups that react against modern thought. They're reacting within the system of modern thought, and they utilize the principles of modernity in order to react against it. Hodge does exactly that. Hodge sees rationalism as a terrible thing. Here's his definition right where it says bad rationalism. Rationalism assumes that the human intelligence is the measure of all truth. There's the problem. The human intelligence is the measure of all truth. This, he says, is an insane presumption on the part of such a creature as man. Here's his analogy. If a child believes with implicit confidence what it cannot understand on the testimony of a parent, surely man may believe what he does not understand on the testimony of God. What Hodge is trying to say here is that God gives revealed truth. Revelation comes to human beings, and it's not irrational to believe in revealed truth something like the Trinity, something like the Incarnation, something like the Atonement, the fact that Jesus was God. These are not irrational. They certainly go beyond reason, but they're not irrational because, well, every child believes on the testimony of a parent, so it's not irrational for an adult to believe on the testimony of God. That's Hodge's argument here. The first part is the interesting part. Rationalism assumes that the human intelligence is the measure of all truth. Hodge wants to disagree with that, but as he develops his system, it will sound a lot like he's agreeing with it. So let's look at his good rationalism here. Revelation, then, is the communication of truths to the mind. The communication of truth to the mind. But the communication of truth presupposes the capacity to receive it. Truth, to be received as an object of faith, must be intellectually apprehended. Now that's interesting. If God is going to reveal himself to human beings, he has to do so in a way that human beings can apprehend that revelation. It must come in such a way that it doesn't remain mystery, that it's apprehended and understood, maybe not fully, but at least partially and at least reasonably by the intellect. And so Hodge puts down a couple of rules that he says applies even to revelation. We would know that revelation is not revelation or that it's a false revelation if it doesn't keep the law of non-contradiction. So it's impossible, Hodge says, that God should reveal anything as true which contradicts any well-authenticated truth, whether of intuition, experience, or previous revelation. Now this becomes very interesting. God's revelation cannot be revelation if it contradicts a well-authenticated truth. Truth by what standards? by scientific standards, if it's found in science repeatedly, is that a well-authenticated truth? Can revelation then not challenge that? If it's a philosophical premise that seems absolutely true, could revelation not challenge that? Hodge takes this one step further. He applies it to the moral realm as well. It's impossible that God should do or approve or command anything that is morally wrong. Well, then it's only God's command if it can be decided on the basis of human reason that it's not morally wrong. 
So I judge, it sounds like, revelation based on my human experience of what's right and wrong. Truth for Hodge is a unity, and that's what's important here. So scientific truth, philosophical truth, logical truth, theological truth, truth about the Bible and truth about God and truth about geology are all the same kind of truth. And so because truth is a unity, truth can't contradict truth. How do we know then the Bible is credible? How do we know that we can put our trust in the Bible? Now, understand Hodge's time here. He's dealing with historical critics who are questioning nearly everything in the Bible. And Hodge wants to set the Bible apart as a firm, definitive sor source and storehouse for revelation, because the Bible is where revelation is located. So how then do we authenticate the Bible as God's revelation? Well, Hodge says there is internal evidence. He says Jesus Christ says that the Bible is reliable, specifically the Old Testament, I guess. And that validates everybody else who's writing, because all of them claim to represent God, and Christ seems to validate them as representing God. That's one of his arguments. That's internal evidence. External evidence, Hodge says, well, the Bible has been very influential over the course of time. It has changed many lives. The only way you can account for that is a supernatural explanation, not a natural explanation. So that gives additional evidence as well. It's clear that these two kinds of evidence are not the same. External evidence will never really persuade someone outside the Christian faith, I suppose. Internal evidence is the important, most important one, at least, for Hodge. Now, Hodge adds to that that the Holy Spirit must work in someone's life. So the Holy Spirit confirms the truth of Scripture to that individual. And now, because Scripture is affirmed as the truth, the storehouse of God's revelation, now the theologian can come along and find in the biblical facts a method and system of Christian thought that can be developed for Christian use. And that's the task of the theologian. But notice a problem here. Already, what Hodge is saying is he's appealing to external evidence and internal evidence. He sounds like he's appealing to subjective kinds of evidence. The Holy Spirit must confirm it in the life of an individual. That leaves Hodge on fairly shaky ground because he's claimed that revelation must be validated by evidence. And now he's saying that the evidence isn't sufficient without the work of the Holy Spirit. If we're to give Hodge credit, I think what he's saying is the evidence points toward the reliability of the Bible, and the Holy Spirit then confirms that to the level of an unshakable faith. So revelation for Hodge is the supernatural objective presentation or communication of truth to the mind by the Spirit of God. Communication of truth always comes to the mind. It's an intellectual proposition, an intellectual affirmation. Listen to that in light of Schleiermacher. For Schleiermacher, it was an intuition or a feeling. It comes to expression over time as it gets worked out in particular cultures. Not so for Hodge. It's an intellectual proposition that's given to the mind by the Holy Spirit. Bible, then, is the storehouse of all of those facts of revelation. And Hodge will strongly emphasize inspiration and infallibility. That God makes the Bible miraculously free from the soiling touch of human fingers. So if the Bible gives us that storehouse of facts, then what is the theologian supposed to do in order to make those facts meaningful to the human being? Well, theology does with the Bible exactly what the natural sciences do with the natural world, according to Hodge. The Bible gives us a storehouse of facts, and the theologian goes through and organizes them, systematizes them, puts them in a meaningful arrangement so that Christian truth can emerge from the Bible. 
So for Hodge, there's really no difference in method from what the theologian does and what the natural scientist does. He puts that in this quote, the true method of theology is the inductive method, which assumes that the Bible contains all the facts or truths which form the contents of theology. Just as the facts of nature are the contents of the natural sciences. That's an interesting word there. The Bible contains all the facts or truths which form the contents of theology. We find them all in the Bible. It is also assumed that the relation of these biblical facts to each other, the principles involved in them, the laws which determine them, are in the facts themselves and are to be deduced from them just as the laws of nature are deduced from the facts of nature. So the way that science works is the way that theology works. Theology's job, as Roger Olson puts it, is to receive the scripture as God's objectively given factual revelation of truth, discover from it the doctrines God wants us to believe, and put them in an orderly system. This is the science of theology. The theologian organizes scriptural truth, and for Hodge, that always comes out in a logical Calvinistic, reformed, well, in many ways, Hodge's influence is still with those who are evangelicals and those who are in particular fundamentalists. Hodge brought a certain depth and a certain conviction of reason. For Hodge, he held together this principle that truth can't contradict truth. And so for Hodge, we always had to find a way to reconcile truths of science with truths of the Bible. And sometimes that's something that fundamentalists especially don't worry about anymore. They simply don't care about or um, reconciling these kinds of truths. So Hodge seems a bit richer in many ways than fundamentalists today, but we see the traces of Hodge in many fundamentalists and many fundamentalists intentionally go back to Hodge to gain a method for doing theology that they think is appropriate for combating modernism and postmodernism in today's world. The first one here that I'll emphasize is that of apologetics. Evangelical apologetics, oftentimes fundamentalist evangelical apologetics, is almost always about facts. It's about the proof of the resurrection, the reasonableness of the Trinity. It's about facts and about the accuracy of historical events in the Bible. And the idea is that one can be intellectually convinced by the Christian faith. That's an optimism that goes back to Hodge. If we give them enough facts, they will believe and they will accept those facts and the truth will win and the individual will accept revelation as being credible and will become a Christian. A second way in which I think we see Hodge with us, especially in fundamentalists today, is the idea that the Bible is a storehouse of facts, that propositions are really what count, and that the way to get at those propositions is to see that the Bible contains everything for theology, and then we go through and we look at different verses, we harmonize those verses, and what comes out there is a system of theology for today. That's all that needs to be known about theology because that's God's word. It's qualitatively different from anything else. I would say a good example here would be Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. If you look at his method, how he goes about it, it seems to be almost exactly the same as Hodge. A third issue that seems important here is inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy of scripture. Now, what I want to emphasize here is that those become almost a first theology. That's the starting point for everything else that can be said about theology. So it's necessary to first show that the Bible is inspired, that every word is inspired, that the Bible is completely inerrant in every way, and then one can do theology working from the Bible. And so bibliology and issues of inerrancy always show up on the first pages of a systematic theology, and then the doctrines get worked out from there.
that is very much something that goes back to Hodge, and it's still very prevalent in evangelical and especially fundamentalist evangelical thought today.